Howdy folks. Uh, we're going to do a little demo here on using a rotary plow. This is something that's a little overdue at Earth Tools since we've been importing the rotary plows since 2001, but better late than never. So here I've got my trusty BCS 850 that I've been using for 18 years uh, with a rotary plow. I put new plow shares on it for the occasion because the other ones were bent up so bad by all our limestone rocks. Uh, and what I've done is I've mowed the area here. The rotary plow is capable of turning in some pretty tall vegetation, but I didn't want to deal with having to deal with that. Um, it, it's actually a lot quicker to uh, degrade down the vegetation if you mow it first. So I use a flail mower to mow all this. That'll let the, the, the uh, material decompose into the ground a lot quicker. So you can see I've walked around and put some stakes in the ground. These are just rebar stakes. Um, and it's a pretty small area we're going to do here for a test plot, uh, just for demonstration purposes. What I've got is 15 feet wide by 25 feet long, and I've put a stake in the middle. Now, you can, you can plow without using stakes, but I'll tell you what, it's a lot easier if you stake off the area to try to get an idea in your mind and, you know, visually as you're using the plow of where your borders are. Otherwise, if you go a little crooked with the line of the plow, it's just harder to regain, you know, your, the shape you want. So this is obviously a rectangle. The stakes in the middle uh, of the span are where I'm going to start my first plow pass, because this is a single rotary plow. That is, pan back over here, this is the single version of the plow, meaning there's a single plow head on this thing, and it only discharges the soil to the right. Uh, there's also a double-headed version of the rotary plow, which we call a swivel plow, or some people call it a reversible plow, which has two plow heads, one above the other, and one turns right and one turns left. This version of the plow only discharges soil to the right. The swivel version, you can flip over so that the left-hand rotating head is in the ground and it discharges to the left. Um, that's the, the, the swivel plow is best for hillsides. It can also be used on odd-shaped plots and even square plots, but using a single plow is perfectly effective in a square plot, especially if it's reasonably level, uh, because if you, use, if, you, if you establish the pattern of plowing correctly, you won't have any wasted passes. That's, again, why I stake this down the middle. So my first pass is going to be down the middle. Then I'm going to turn the thing, uh, I'm going to turn it around, and you're going to see me create a wider ditch before I uh, start essentially filling that ditch from both sides. So <clears throat> I'll stop talking and start acting a little bit. A word here, I do have a transport wheel on the back of the plow and that can also be used for gauge wheel purposes. I'm gonna go ahead and bring that up to the maximum depth position. You can plow without the wheel on it at all, but you'll find that you can gain a little straighter line by using the wheel. Even with the wheel up to its maximum position, you sacrifice maybe an inch of total depth, but you pick that up in precision. So I'm gonna, since there's no established plow pattern here at all, I'm gonna go ahead and advance it up, sacrifice an inch of depth, and get a little more
bit about what I just did. This is a field that hasn't been plowed in about 15 years, uh, at least. Uh, and it's very hard. This is clay soil. Uh, we haven't had a whole lot of rain. We had some recently, so it's loosened it up a little bit. And you can see what I'm cutting through here. We've got inch diameter tree roots. Uh, we've got well, quite a few tree roots, actually. And it's not going to full depth on the first pass. The rotary plow is capable of getting about 10 to 12 inches deep. But on the first pass, you're never going to get that kind of depth because, as you can see, the plow is slanted. Uh, it's cocked to one side, which means the auger is sort of pointing off at an angle. That slant is made to compensate for the fact that when, you're, when your plow pattern is fully established, you're actually operating with one of the wheels, which will be the right wheel in this case, down in the trench. So with the right wheel down in the trench and the tractor cocked to the side, it actually levels up the plow and lets all four blades of the plow shares dig into the ground. So it really gets some depth. On the first pass, and even on the second and third, you're not going to get full depth because the plow angle is not optimal. So we're only going about well, five, six inches deep here on the first pass. And it's, you know, you can see that the tractor is even spinning a little bit as it encounters these roots and has to chew its way through them. So now I'm going to turn the tractor around and I'm going to create a wider trench by throwing the soil out to either side. talk for a minute. So I was just plowing out the little bit I missed on the first pass. So what I've done, moved over, blasted the soil out to that side. Now we have a wider trench. Now I want to point out the importance of having your wheels set at the optimal distance apart. The rotary plow is an implement that is fussy about how wide apart the wheels are set. And this is very obvious in this case here. I have my wheels set for mowing applications. I have a lot of slopes here and I, I mow on slopes all the time so I want maximum stability. So I've got my wheels pretty wide apart. There's actually about 20 inches of space between these wheels. That's a little far apart to be optimal for the rotary plow. And as you can see, when I made my second pass and I had that one wheel planted in the furrow, I actually left a little bit of an unplowed ridge here because the space between the edge of the wheel and the beginning of the plowshare was a little too great. I'm going to make a, another pass through here and cut out this, this ridge, but I'll, I'll make another pass on this side first. Uh, so I'm going to, typically if you have the wheels set right, which is ideally about 17 to 18 inches apart inside to inside measurement, that is 18, 17 to 18 inches of space down the middle, then you'll never have this kind of high center. The plow will actually cover the entire piece of ground. So I've been lazy here by not changing my wheels, uh, or not changing my wheel spacing rather, and now I'm gonna have to pay for it by making another couple passes. You will not start unless you put down the safety lever.
got a wide enough furrow and a deep enough furrow that I can actually start refilling it. So now is when the plow really will start coming into its own because I'm going to drop the right hand wheel down in the trench which will level up the top of the plow and I'll be plowing this soil back into the trench from either side. It typically takes about three passes wide to establish a wide enough trench that when you start shifting the soil back into the trench, you don't just throw it over the trench. That's what you want to avoid. You don't want to avoid starting with such a narrow trench down the middle that when you start backfilling the trench and working your way out towards the outsides of the bed, you don't just throw it back and forth and back and forth all day long. That can become quite repetitive. So, as, you, as I plow, you'll see some of this will land on the other side, but the majority of it's going to land in the center. And then I'm going to essentially shift this trench, I'm going to sort of split it into two trenches and move those trenches out consistently towards the edge of the bed. right out there is a good example of what's going to happen anytime you're breaking new ground with a rotary plow and that is I got off course. The tractor kind of swerved when the plow hit a root and kind of came back in towards the trench so I backed up and I reset myself. Don't be afraid to do that. If you're going forward and you get a little crooked and you try to just correct it you're going to end up with a crooked line which is really not what you want. You're better off just backing up and getting straight again and trying to make as straight a line as possible. Once you get a crooked line, it sort of exacerbates itself. Note also that I'm locking the differential every time I'm making a plow pass. That locks in both wheels to give me maximum traction. In this hard ground, otherwise one of the wheels just spins.
took that last one a little crooked just to try to straighten out my end. I want to make a point here about how in the first half of the video, you could see I was trying to guide the machine very uh, sternly. <laughs> I was really holding tight and kind of fighting the machine. And then in the last few passes, I really slacked off, took one hand off and just kind of stood at arm's distance from the thing and obviously not working very hard. And I did that on purpose to illustrate the importance of not fighting the plow. When I was fighting the plow, trying to direct it and shove it and push it and keep it in the ground, it was no more effective than when I just backed off. It did just as good a job plowing either way. This thing has a lot more power than me, and it's going to win if it tries to do something. So when I was fighting it, which is the natural inclination of anybody using one of these for the first time, I was wearing myself out. The very first time I ever used a rotary plow, that's what I did. I fought it for two hours, and when I was completely worn out and stopped fighting it, I noticed, hey, it's doing just as good a job. So I wanted to illustrate that on video so that when you get your rotary plow for the first time and you think you have to fight it, which you will, relax. It's okay. You don't have to fight it. You can actually put in a full day's work with it and not feel terrible at the end of the day because you don't have to fight it but you will have that human instinct of trying to control it first. So, what I'm doing, as you can see now, I'm plowing my way outward towards the edges of the bed. Now, people would look at this and say, oh, that's a beautiful raised bed. Well, it is, but really all we've got is the soil from these two ditches thrown up into this raised bed. The rest of the raised effect of it is all the air that's in that bed. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of air in this soil now. We've done one pass over this. This was, as you can see, virgin sod, tree roots, and everything else. And we have uh, a good foot deep of worked soil. Uh, so that's pretty incredible for a walk behind piece of equipment to leave that kind of finish. Lots of tree roots in there. Uh, very heavy clay soil as well. Uh, so what I would typically do in a situation like this, I wouldn't consider this a raised bed. I would continue plowing and this same scenario can be mirrored in a larger area. That is, if you want to plow a 50 by 100 foot plot or a 200 by 400 foot plot or a 400 by 400 foot plot, whatever it is you're plowing, plow the whole plot first. Don't try to plow individual raised beds one at a time. That gets very inefficient. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plow out to the edges of this and make a you know 15 by 25 bed and we're, we can pretend that that's any size and then i'm going to come back with the rotary plow and delineate the raised beds in that already worked soil so i'm going to take the soil that's already worked a foot deep and i'm going to mound it up into raised beds making it more like 16 or 18 inches deep because i'm going to take the soil from what's going to be the paths and put it into the bed we'll get to that in the next uh, segment i'm going to finish this off uh, off camera you don't have to watch any more of this right now and then we'll come back to the camera when it's fully plowed and we'll form up some raised beds. Okay, so now we've plowed out the whole plot. We've got a nice piece of ground here plowed up, about 12 inches deep. Uh, now normally, after you plowed a piece of ground like this that was kind of raw sod, you would let it sit for at least a week, maybe two, three weeks, depending on moisture conditions to give it time to break that sod down and, and uh, you know, biodegrade the organic matter that you've just plowed into the soil. I don't have the luxury of that because we're shooting a video. So I'm gonna go ahead and form this up into raised beds. So as we form this up, you're gonna see some clumps and clods in there where the, the sod is still essentially alive in there. But now that we've plowed it all out and have a reasonably flat surface, what I'm gonna do is use the plow to delineate where the pathways are going to be. So the plow is going to shift the soil into what's going to be the beds. Now on each edge of the bed, we've already got a furrow because that's the last furrow that was created by the plow. So that's going to be my first walkway. Um, yeah, I don't even have to run back here. I'll just start on this end. So I'll drive the tractor back to the other side and shift some soil over. Now if I wanted to be um, scientific about this, I would get out my tape measure and actually set some stakes where I wanted the edges of my bed to be. That is, if I wanted 30 inch beds, I would get an idea of that by putting the stakes in, you know, 30 inches from the top edge of that bed. Um, so let me illustrate that. Follow me over here. So if I wanted this to end up as a 30 inch wide bed, 
this is going to be the one edge. I would measure over 30 inches, and then I would say put this stake here. And then I would put the plow right here. So it's going to cut from here, and it's going to take the soil that's in this path and put it on top of this 30-inch bed. And of course, I would put a matching stake at the other end. Use a string if you have to. Uh, it just depends. I mean, once you get really good at this, maybe you can forego the stakes and strings, but you know, most people aren't that good, including me. Uh, so I'm just going to, since I didn't bring any strings, I didn't bring a tape measure, uh, we're just going to eyeball this and try to get a reasonably uh, uh, consistently shaped bed here. As you can see, my measuring wasn't quite right. I didn't end up with a whole bed on the end, so I decided to take one less pass and try to form it up. A couple more passes here and I'd have a decent 30 inch bed there. But as you can see how on a couple of those, I had made a crooked pass, of course, because I didn't have stakes and had nothing to sight for. Uh, so I just backed up and straightened it out. It's not a problem to redo a line if you get crooked with a rotary plow. Just back up and take it straight the next time. You know, you kind of cut in a little bit You'll notice that when you're, when you're crossing ground that's really, really loose like this, the rotation of the plow in the soil actually will try to pull the machine to one side. Even though, it, it, I mean, it can't make the wheels steer because the wheels don't steer, but it actually makes the wheels like slide across the soil just a little bit. So you have to, when I'm, when I'm driving across a level surface of really loose soil, I almost have to keep the tractor caught slightly you figure this out after you've been using a little while, but you can get really consistent and obviously make some really nice beds. As you can see, as I noted earlier, we've got clumps in here because it's not been drained down yet. Um, but we can let it sit a few weeks, run a tiller or a power harrow across the top of this and it'll be smooth and uh, well formed and ready to plant. So, 
Thanks for watching.